What up, what up, what up, what up? It's your boy P. Skip. Welcome to the best half hour of your entire Tuesday. You know what time it is, and it's time to get into his court. My squad with the T Mac. Hola. Chili Will. Gracias, gracias, amigos. Let's do this. So listen, y'all. We're going to go ahead and read John chapter 12, verse 32 in the New Living. It says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. Recently, um, I had we had a situation in the NBA that reminded me of the NFL when the Buffalo Bills football player DeMar Hamlin had a heart attack on the football field. USC freshman Bronny James had uh, suffered cardiac arrest during a workout with his uh, with the USC football team. I mean basketball team. LeBron James uh, posted recently that his son, when he was out with his son Bronny, uh, Savannah, Bryce, and Zuri that Bronny is up, out eating, and playing the piano. So I'm looking at this and I'm going, LeBron James' son, his wasn't as massive as Hamlin's was because it wasn't seen. But I can only imagine if it, it kind of reminds you of a Lynn Bias situation. You know, yes. how Bias uh, collapsed on the basketball court. Um, thank God for modern. Hey, Re Reggie, Reggie Lewis. Reggie Lewis as well. Yeah. And Hank Gathers. And yeah, Hank, Hank Gathers, Gathers yeah. as well. Yeah. So we've seen this right now. They still haven't given a diagnosis on why it happened, but they just know. Think of how would you react to you going to your son's game and seeing him have a heart attack on the court? Man, look, hey. Hey, I, right now, y'all know Demetrius Beekman. Right. And you know yep. what happened with his son. Right. Yeah. And I can't imagine. I pray for Beekman and his and his uh his his and Julie, uh Bryce's mom and they family twice a day. Cause I, I I couldn't take that, man. I don't know how they deal with that, man. That is tough to deal with, man. I just feel for them, man. I feel for them. For those who don't know, Will, why don't you let why don't you let the audience know? First of all, Demetrius Beekman is from Milwaukee. He's a he played. He was a star athlete for uh, King. He went to King, King, King High School, right? Rupert King, King. Yeah, Rupert King. Right. Yeah. So tell him what happened. Well, I, you know, I don't want to put their business out in the streets, but it's all over. You know, it's, it's this is yesterday's news. They they son um, had uh, some type of situation during COVID, and he didn't recover from it. He wound up uh, transitioning. And oh, it was really the, other son, the football player, the football player. Right, right. right. I right. thought you were talking about not Reese, not Reese Bryce. Bryce, Bryce is the older right. son. Right, 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 he played right. safety for the University of Washington, no, Washington State. State, Washington yeah. State University, yeah. and was a heck of a player. I used to watch all of his games late night on TV. Right, and um, you know, and I, you know, I know, I, I knew him very well. You know, so I can't imagine. You know, and I, I talked to Beekman. I seen him at a funeral and, you know, I told him I love him. I hugged him. And, um, and you know, and I told him, man, I don't know how you do it. And he just said, well, it's day to day. Yeah. He was also, a, 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 he was attending World Outreach for about a year, him and his wife. Yeah. Maria. yeah. And um, I, 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 I talked with him a lot concerning that issue. But, you know, when you're dealing with, a death in your family, especially a son, or the the possible death of a child. You know, I went through it with Quentin. Quentin was uh, at home, about to do his uh, regular routine of, you know, drinking something cold before he went to bed. He grabbed a cold glass of water, drank it, and he said, all of a sudden, he got a splitting headache. So, you know, he thought, you know, most people say, well, I'm going to go to bed anyway. I'll just go ahead and sleep it off. It's just a headache. Right. But the Holy Spirit would not let him go to sleep. And it got worse. So we, he ended up getting rushed to the hospital or he drove himself to the hospital only to find out that he had a brain aneurysm. Wow. 
Yeah, Quentin had the same thing, Moya Moya disease, that killed Johnny Cochran. Wow. And so, you know, this can happen to anybody's family in any situation. You or know, any of that, us. Or any of any us, for that matter. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, so we really have to make sure that, one, we have a relationship with God. Two, Amen. we yeah. have, we go get ourselves checked out. We go to the doctor. We do those things. Mm -hmm. But three, not only do you have health insurance, but you better make sure you got life insurance, but not just natural life, but whole life, which is, like I said, a relationship with God that's so important. I know you want to add something in here, Tim. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of unimaginable to have someone like a, a child, you know, pass or have a life-threatening situation. You know, every parent expects to, you know, go on to the afterlife prior to their ch children and have the children outlive them. But right. even a death of a loved one, child, mom, sister, brother, anyone close to you leaves a hole and it has a uh, impact that has to be dealt with on a case by case basis. And to your point, Pastor Skip, having the relationship with God, I think, is an anchor on a couple of different fronts. One, having that whole life insurance, of course, knowing that your afterlife is assured and that you will be in the presence of the Lord afterwards. Number two, for the remaining family members, sometimes when somebody in the family dies, there's a level of guilt from the remaining survivors of, well, hey, this loved one is dead. I'm still here. And they begin to live their lives almost zombie like. And so now you have two deaths, the death of the person that died, as well as now the walking dead of the remaining survivors. Having a relationship with Christ helps to bring comfort and peace to one's soul and inner man or inner spirit to help continue to go on guilt-free in that you may still grieve from time to time. You might shed a tear. You might even reflect when you're out by yourself thinking about the memory of that loved one that was lost, but you're able to get through it and continue to function on in life. As it relates to Bronnie James, specifically in this circumstance, given who his family is, who his dad is, who he is, the stature, all the hoopla, as well as the severity of what happened to him. The young man had a heart attack at 18. His right. entire yes. world, world class athlete, world, world class, class athlete. athlete. Exactly. I mean, so this is very, very serious on the mortality sense. The fact that he didn't die like those that we've mentioned before, the Reggie Lewis's of the world, Hank Gathers, you know, and others, uh, Lynn Bias, that is in and of itself a blessing. Man, you still here. So let's yeah. celebrate that. Let's get our arms all around that. Let's get your mentality and your mind wrapped around the fact that you have another chance and you did not die. It wasn't fatal for you. The second piece is, is that what does your future hold as it relates to athletics? Was it a situation where you're saying, well, hey, man, my career might be over before it fully started because I still want to be able to live life. Uh, what are the, the side effects, the different things maybe that the doctors have done, the research they've done as to what caused it? Can it happen again? Is this going to be a recurring type thing? Was it induced by something, maybe a vaccine or some other thing that helped trigger it that can be monitored or mitigated? There's still a lot of questions that they may have answers to that they not that they have not yet made public. But I respect the fact that they have some serious decisions to make because life and death is nothing really to play with. Right. And last thing I'll say is given his circumstance, you know, you never want to have to give up anything that you love. But if there was a way to have a soft landing given as close as his family is to basketball, his dad being obviously who he is, his younger brother also being a baller, he'll still be able to be close to the game so he can get his basketball Jones. He just might not be able to play anymore. And I hope that's not the case. But if that is the scenario, you have to look for the silver lining in every cloud, similar to Jay Williams from Duke having that horrific Motorcycle accident after being the second pick in the draft, career being cut short, but him still being a broadcaster and things like that. He's still close to the game, even though some bodily injury and harm kept him from playing. So a lot of things still yet to be remained or made public. 
surrounding this. But first and foremost, thankful to God that the young man did not die. He's Thank still God. alive. Yeah. You know God. what I mean? Yeah. And so now there's some other things about secondary decisions of, hey, what does this mean for my career moving forward? Moving forward, let's go on a lighter note. Milwaukee right. Bucks second-year player Marjan Bochamp drops 83. Yeah, that's right. I said it, 8-3, 83 wow. points in a Pro-Am contest. In a game in Seattle Pacific University uh, event, he, he, he had a scoring record of 83 points. Now, don't get me wrong. He wasn't playing against pros, but he wasn't playing against horrible cats either. Because Pro Am League is that just that. Pro amateurs. So he dropped 83. And what it's what it said uh reading the article is that he looked like his game has developed more into a pro type of game. Because they said he got this 83 effortlessly. Like he wasn't, he wasn't forcing it. It was like, hey, you leave me open, I'm making you pay for. It. They said his scoring was a Kobe Bryant type of going off. You know, Will, you're you're one of the ones who said, right? You're one of the ones who said he was going to be a a bigger factor this year more than ever. Oh, definitely, definitely. Year, I'm sorry. Both, both rookies, AJ Green and Marjan Brochamp, <clears throat> were excellent rookies last year on the Bucks. They played, they rose very well. They helped us win some games. Um, they looked um, poised. They never looked nervous or out of place. They were always ready and prepared to go in and contribute. So those guys, if the two rookies we got this year are anywhere near as good as the two we got last year, then we can start moving the the, the pendulum a little bit with our youth movement because last year the Bucks was the oldest team in the league. So if we get those four younger players, you know, now we starting to get a, a balance and a mix between the seasoned veterans and some rookies who are able to contribute and get more experience at a slower pace. Damn. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned if he looked like Kobe Bryant because Kobe Bryant was, all due respect, top five player all time. Yes, maybe on the cusp of the Mount Rushmore. He also was greedy. He was a ball. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't gun shy at all. So uh, I, I agree that Bochamp showed a lot of promise. I'm really disappointed that he didn't get much more burn in his rookie year. I thought he could have helped us even more in the regular season and particularly in the playoffs you know, with our unfortunate ex in the first round to the Miami Heat. But him scoring his 83, I think it was a huge boost to his confidence, even though it was pro-am, it still was, you know, noteworthy. 83 is 83. You playing Little League or, you know what I'm saying, playground, whatever you play, any organized yeah, basketball. You got to make the ball go through the hoop. <laughs> you got to make it go through the hoop. Exactly right. So, you know, kudos for that. I think the bigger question will be is that, if he, and I believe he will, get more time, particularly if he's showing in training camp that he's willing to work hard on both ends of the floor, offense and defense, he will have earned some minutes. Coach Griffin coming in as a new coach probably wants to demonstrate that he's a fair kind of guy, egalitarian. If you earn some minutes, I'm going to go ahead and give you a chance to shine. That said, even if he does get minutes, even substantially with the starting five or he's the main man coming off the bench in that second unit, the question I have is, will he be able to fluidly give his contributions without having to have the ball? Being a guy whose game is matured enough and finessed enough such that, hey, any opportunity you give me, whether on the ball, off the ball, me getting hustle baskets, getting putbacks, things like that, can he contribute that way? If he's able to do that, say, hey, anytime you put me in, coach, I'm going to produce. I don't need to get 25 minutes to give you production. I don't need to be the sole focus of the offense. I can be the third or fourth option and still be productive. And if he can do those kinds of things and contribute, let's say, anywhere between, let's say, seven and 13, 14 points for the Bucks, I think we have a keeper. If he can do that in his second year, 
Now, as time goes on, year three, year four, beyond, he can become more part of more featured part of the offense. And more importantly, on his way to being that, he can be a valuable contributor to us in what we need. We need more weapons, particularly in the playoffs. If teams continue to, you know, triple team Giannis, Drew has to draw the toughest assignment on the opposing team player, so he's a little drained. And Chris Middleton still working through his injuries. It would be nice to have a solid guy that we can count on to produce night in, night out, even when the air gets a little bit thinner in the playoffs. And my man is seeming like he's playing with an attitude of showing proofs and just give me the opportunity. I'll show y'all. Similar to Bud Crawford getting the opportunity against Spence and beating him like he stole something in that fight on the other night. Yeah, not fair. Not fair. Shots so listen, fired. Shots fired. <laughs> boom. Facts. So, so Facts. listen. Sticking with the, I think there's two things. Um, well, let me say this: with the um, releasing of uh, Matthews, I think he's now in that went to Atlanta. There's some more clock there for him. And Ingles. And Ingles. And Ingles. Right. So yes. there should be some more clock for him there. Um, mm. But on another note, the Bucks signed Thanasis, re-signed him to another year contract. He got the minimum, but he's still on another year with the Bucks. So, but um, New York tried to sign it. New York wanted to sign it, but he ended up re-signing with the Bucks. Of course he did. Here's another one I, I want us to talk about, y'all. So, with all the ESPN shakeups and firings and and all of that, ESPN has fired Van Gundy and Mark Jackson. Mm. Now you got a whole different crew that's about to do the NBA Finals. On I'll read the statement on Tuesday. It was revealed that Doris Burks and former NBA head coach Doc Rivers were being targeted by the network to revamp their NBA coverage left uh, Jackson's hole with the company in doubt. ESPN is closing in on Doris Burke to be the, for the NBA Finals, hiring Doc Rivers to join her and laying off Mark Jackson. In the wake of Jeff Van Gundy firing in, the late, in late June, ESPN set their eyes on making Burks the first woman TV analyst on the NBA Finals, hiring Doc Rivers and uh, Hall of Famer play-by-play -play, uh, Mark Breen. From what they're saying is Mark Jackson was released because they made Doris Burke the number one, and she and Mark didn't get along, so they got rid of him, got Doc Rivers, and brought in Mark Breen. So they got rid of that whole crew. Not the whole crew. Breen was part Breen of was it. Yeah, right, right. Breen was, yeah. was the uh the uh play by play guy. Yeah. So they revamped. Now here's my thing. First of all, there's a couple things. One, this is the second time Mark Jackson has gotten laid off from a good job for some reason. We we don't know if this was budget cuts. We don't know if this is if, if again, this is him standing on whatever he's standing on. And the higher ups didn't like it, or maybe it's because Doris Burke helps bring in another demographic of women that they said let's shake this up. I I think part of Van Gundy's thing was salaries, because they released a, a lot of people for um, salaries. But I don't really understand all of the shakeups that's happening with ESPN. What do you think? Do you think that Breen Doc and Doris Burke is going to work. Well, it's going to it's going to have to work. Um, and I know all the shakeups is for financial. Uh, right. ESPN lost billions of dollars during. I mean, because they're a Disney company, so not ESPN. Right. Disney lost billions of dollars during the pandemic because they have theme parks, and people were not going to theme parks, so they lost money. So they got to recoup that money in the best way. You guys know, y'all got budgets. The best way to recruit to recruit money is you got to get rid of bodies. Right. You know, you got to get rid of people. You got to cut payroll. Yeah. 
So, so from that standpoint, I understand why it's happening because it's a lot of other people who fell by the wayside also. But I want to say this just in defense of Doris Burke. Doris Burke is an outstanding, outstanding basketball person. And I, I love listening to her. I love her interviews. She is very good. So I don't want nobody to think this is just a female thing. No, she's earned her stripes. She is a, she's one of the best at what she does. So after, after saying that, the other thing, too, is sometimes stuff runs its course. Van Gundy and, 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 and Mark Jackson, well, they took somebody's place. You know, Magic used to do this back in the day. Bill Russell used to do this back in the day. Bill Walsh, there's a lot of people who used to do this, and they run its course, and then you get somebody else new to come in. It might just be the changing of the guard also. You can pay a person a little less money if they're not, you know, they ain't got the, this, this much seniority. So I think part of it is economic and part of it is they want to, you know, they want to just try something different and try something to see what Doris Burke, Burke can bring to the, to the, to the table. And I think she'll be fine. I feel bad for, uh, for Mark Jackson and Van Gundy because me personally, I really enjoyed them doing the game, but right. I'm old school. Right. They probably needed something a little newer. But don't get me wrong. Doris Burke ain't younger than them. And no. Neither, and neither is Doc. No, no. Both of them are About the same them. age. About the same age. Yeah. So go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I would have to agree with much of what, you know, Will said. I think that the cutbacks are serious. I mean, uh, Bob Iger was brought back as CEO of Disney, former longtime guy that really jammed while he was there. They were bleeding. They're looking to eliminate or severely cut back their streaming services. So they were really looking to cut costs. And those two gentlemen happen to be casualties of said cuts. As it relates to Doris Burke coming in and Doc Rivers, I don't know if it's going to be as enjoyable. Doris Burke is cold. I enjoy her. Mike Bream is bang and bang. I mean, so it's Still going to be great as a basketball fan. I'm going to watch anyway, even if I turn the volume all the way down. I'm still going to see the visual. Um, but Doc Rivers, I don't know, man. His voice is kind of scruffy, you know what I mean? And, and the banter, I don't know if he will have the easy chemistry that Mark Jackson and Jeff Van Gundy had and the good cop, bad cop. They were able to even have conflict without it spilling over into disrespect and, you know, compromising the quality of what the viewer saw in watching, you know, the game. I've they've grown on me. I've I've come become used to seeing them there. I'm gonna miss that trio of calling games the way they call it, the way they see things. And we'll have to get used to this new team. But I think it was really, really a a, a case of really cutting costs, you know, shaking things up a little bit. And it doesn't hurt that Doris Burke is, you know, a a woman as we're looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion all across the corporate spectrum, I think it was a good move on Disney's part and ESPN's part. They don't have anything really to lose because the product that they're putting out, i.e. NBA basketball games, is still going to draw eyeballs to it so long as what goes on on the court remains high quality like it has been over these last couple of years. And given all the things that are coming up, the new uh, collective bargaining agreement, Folks getting paid, player movement. This promises to be one of the better and, and, the, and the mid season, the mid season, the mid season tournament in Las Vegas. Mid season tournament, all of that stuff. So this, you know, is safe enough to be kind of a barnstormer of a, a season for the NBA, and I'm looking forward to it. Despite this little change in uh, announcing staff. Well, let me let me just say this too, uh, Skip. Just give me a second to say this. Yeah, I agree with Tim. I don't understand the Doc Rivers piece. I just don't. Doc Rivers didn't seem to me to be that dude for that position because I, I don't know how they going to – because Mark Jackson and, and Van Gundy, man, them guys, was they was a, they was a heck of a duo. Mm -hmm. They had chemistry. Yeah. Exactly. But don't forget, Doc used to be a uh, – he was on TV for a while during the NBA. Yeah, yeah, but he ain't – Doc Rivers ain't nobody who I look forward to, you know, I just don't. Tuning in, like, too. Yeah. Right. I mean, you and know, I, don't get me wrong. I love Doc Rivers. He's a great guy. Right. Spent time in Milwaukee. Right. Good dude. You know, from you know Maywood. I mean, I ain't got no problems with Doc personally. Right. But Doc, I would much rather see Van Gundy and Jackson than Doc Rivers. But let's see. We'll see. Maybe maybe he'll show us something. 
So what you're saying is you don't want to hear seven games of horse. Man. You just got to pass the ball, I tell you. That's precisely what we we're communicating. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so let me close on this note. I don't know if you heard, but in wake of Portland Trailblazer, Damian Lillard posturing to be traded to Miami Heat, Aaron Goodwin the of the NBA sent a memo to all 30 teams Friday stating that any NBA player or his agent who makes public or private comments indicating he won't fully perform the services called for under his player contract in the event of a trade will be subject to discipline. So basically, if you say you want to be traded, and you kind of, and they won't trade you, and you don't, and you go in as a disgruntled employee, you're going to be disciplined from the NBA now. I, I'm, 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 I want to see what the president on this is going to be. Yeah. Right. I, right. I, I'm waiting to see too, but I don't know what you're trying to pull, but whatever it is, this ain't going to work for the NBA. It's not going to work for the players. You're going to end up with a strike. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to prove too. How do you how do you prove? Yeah, how do you prove it? Yes. How do you prove it? Right. So we'll see. Well, listen, another great show. Meet us back here, same back time, same back channel of the number one faith-based sports talk show in the entire world. Into his courts. Until next week, have an amazing week. Peace. Peace.